like a little Sturgill Simpson. Uh, I'm really more of a rock guy, but I do like some country, and Sturgill Simpson is one of those uh, country performers that I really like. He reminds me of the the outlaw guys from the 70s and 80s, Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, Hank Williams Jr., David Allen Coe, and, and some of the other outlaws from that era. Uh, in this video lecture I want to talk about industrial toxicology which is unit two in our online class but before I jump into industrial toxicology let's do a quick review of some of our takeaways or hopefully they were takeaways from unit one uh, industrial hygiene focuses on conditions in the workplace having an impact on worker health noise bad air vibration radiation heat cold and toxic substances and speaking of toxic substances the bulk of the attention in industrial hygiene has to do with workplace chemical exposure and keeping workers safe from dangerous chemicals in the workplace uh, as safety professionals including industrial hygienists again there are some safety professionals who specialize in industrial hygiene but as safety professionals, even if we're not a specialist in industrial hygiene, part of our job is to evaluate the hazards in the workplace, including the chemical hazards, including the hazards from vibration, heat, cold, and other industrial hygiene types of hazards. We evaluate those hazards through an evaluation process, and then we identify controls to protect the workers. And ideally, all of this is proactive and preventative. We do this to protect workers in advance. We, if we do that in advance, then we don't have as much uh, time spent reacting to injuries, dealing with injuries, managing injuries, or other uh, harmful consequences of workplace exposures. Again, there is an emphasis on the monitoring of, of for workplace exposures and keeping workers under the uh, known exposure limits or exposure limits known to be thresholds between what is safe and what is dangerous. Now in unit one I just touched upon the subject of exposure limits. In this unit we're going to have an entire video lecture where I really uh, dig into, dive into the subject of exposure limits. Also in this unit, uh, I'm going to have a, <coughs> a video tutorial on time-weighted average and how to calculate the time-weighted average because exposure limits close re closely related to time-weighted average. So in quick summary, what we're going to be doing in this unit, uh, the industrial toxicology lecture, the exposure limits lecture, and the time-weighted average video tutorial. Uh, I also am thinking about, I probably will, and as you know, it's not, as you can tell, it's not done yet, um, 
I will probably go ahead and include a, a short video lecture that looks in more detail at some of the different sources of information available to us. Sources of information that can help us learn more about toxic substances in the workplace. Well, let's go ahead and talk about industrial, uh, industrial toxicology. And the first thing we need to consider when we talk about industrial toxicology is what is toxicology. Toxicology is the study of poisons and the adverse impacts those uh, poisons have on living organisms. Yeah, there are several terms that can be used interchangeably. Uh, we can talk about poisons, we can use the term toxin, or even the fancy term toxicant is sometimes used when referring to poisons. So all of these, if I use the word toxin or toxicant, I'm talking about a poison. But most of the time I'll try to just keep it simple and uh, talk about this poison or that poison. But again, I may use the term toxin or toxicant. Um, yeah. With any of these terms, whichever you prefer, these are substances having adverse health impacts. Industrial toxicology is the specialty area focusing on poisons in the workplace and the potential impact on exposed workers. And that's what, again, that's what we're here for. That's what we're, we're really interested in is poisons in the workplace and the impact on exposed workers. Another thing I need to mention about poisons and poisons in the workplace and toxins is that the toxic effects of any substance is largely dependent, not exclusively dependent, but largely dependent on the dosage. It could be argued, and there's a lot of support for this, that any substance uh, at the right dosage could be uh, a toxin for living organisms. Anything at the right dosage, even water, you may have heard about water intoxication. Too much water that dilutes the electrolytes in your blood, that can have adverse effects on, on organisms. Another example of how anything can be a toxin in, the, in large enough doses is what we have here in this note. 15% of accidental deaths from poisoning in children is from aspirin overdose. 15%, let me read that again, 15% of the accidental deaths from poisoning in children is from aspirin overdose. Aspirin is fatal at a dose of 0.5 grams per kilogram of body weight. Aspirin that we take for pain is probably the most common over-the-counter medication. Everybody has it in their homes. Uh, it, can be, it can be deadly in, uh, in certain dosages. Uh, there's also a, uh, I talk about it in the face-to-face -face class. When I do this class face-to-face, -face, I bring it to class and pass it around. And I may have it behind me. I don't remember if it's here or, yep, yeah, there it is. Oh. And what really would have been funny is if my chair had fallen over, but thank goodness it didn't. Uh, this is a book that really hits on this idea of the effect of dosage on the, uh, on, a, on the toxicity of a substance. The dose makes the poison. And this article is, or this book is about what I've been, been saying here on this slide. Just about anything in uh, at a sufficient dosage or at an excessive dosage can have toxic, even deadly effects on organisms, including the human organism. So uh, it's not just it's not just H2S, it's not just carbon monoxide, but there are a lot of different substances that can have toxic effects on, on, on humans. Well, let's talk about safety professionals and industrial toxicology. How does this have any impact on our profession, on our careers? Uh, we do need to know about toxins, about poisons in our workplace, but we don't need to know about every possible toxin that's out there. Now, in, in the construction world, 
these were the hazardous substances, the toxins, the poisons that I was most focused on, that I knew the most about. Again, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, silica, lead, asbestos, and oxygen deficiencies. And then toward the end of my career as a field uh, construction manager, hexavalent chromium and zinc oxide be became uh, more uh, apparent on my radar. Hexavalent chromium, zinc oxide, these are some hazardous substance, some poisons, some toxins that can be generated during welding operations or cutting operations. But these top uh, six that I have here, those were, the, those were the major concerns for me and the type of construction that I did. Uh, mostly heavy industrial or heavy civil and uh, highway and bridge type of construction. If you end up in uh, working in general industry, let's say in a paper mill, there will be a certain set of poisons that you will need to be most familiar with. You don't need to know everything. Don't need to know everything. Um, what we do need to know is where to find information about a new toxin. Maybe there's a new toxin that has been introduced into our workplace. We need to know where to find that information. And I covered that to, to some degree in Unit 1, and we're going to talk about it more in Unit 2, some sources of information about different uh, poisonous substances that may show up in the workplace. Now, I said we don't need to know everything. There's one, there's one uh, caveat to that. If we go on and specialize in industrial hygiene and we want to take the CIH exam, you know about the CIH exam from, uh, from Unit 1, if we get that specialized in industrial hygiene, we will need to know more about a wide variety of toxins. If I bring in a CIH to do some consulting work in my facility, I'm going to expect them to have a pretty good handle on a lot of different toxins, not just a, a limited list like we have here. And I'm going to expect them also to know where to get more information. But they, they should have, if that's their specialty, they should be uh, they should have a, a greater body of knowledge than a generalist safety manager would have uh, when it comes to poisons in the workplace. There are several categories of toxins. Uh, this is a subject, oh, let me go back to this slide for just a second. Uh, I mentioned the CIH exam. I know some of you are already thinking about the uh, CSP exam or maybe some of you are even thinking about the ASP exam. But now keep in mind, if you graduate from our program, you don't need to take the ASP uh, because we are a qualified academic program. What you'll need to do when you graduate is apply for the GSP. And if you have the GSP, you don't have to take the ASP. I know there's a lot of P's there, if you, <laughs> and that might get confusing. If you have any questions about any of that, let me know. But let's say, let's just talk about the CSP exam. You sit for the CSP exam. There, there could be questions about a fairly wide variety of toxins um, on that exam. Uh, but I would still argue you don't need to be an expert on every type of toxin that's out there and every specific toxin. Again, most important, this, where to find that information. Uh, Albert Einstein, we all consider him to be one of the you know, the geniuses of, of the, the 20th and 21st centuries, or the, I guess the 20th century was when he was, was active. He was the genius of the 20th century. Einstein said, if it's written down, we don't need to memorize it. And that was kind of how he conducted himself. If it's good enough for Albert Einstein, that's certainly, uh, that philosophy, philosophy is certainly good enough for me and should be good enough for most of us. If it's written down, know where it's written down, but we don't need to memorize it. It's impossible to memorize everything anyway, so let's focus on sources of information, reading that information, and being able to understand what we read. That, that I think that's more of a key than memorizing a bunch of uh, industrial poisons. The toxin categories. Uh, hepatoxin. 
Now, if I was in a face-to-face class, I'd say, anybody know what a hepatoxin is? And some of you would. Uh, a hepatoxin is a toxin affecting the liver, hematoxin, a toxin affecting our blood directly, nephrotoxin affects our kidneys, our renal system, neurotoxin, I bet most people get this one. This is our this is a toxin that affects our central nervous system. Uh, we have other toxins that focus more on the endocrine system. That's the system that that generates the hormones that we need in our body. There are toxins that are pulmonary system specific, respiratory toxins. There are toxins that affect our reproductive health that interferes with reproduction. And there are immunotoxins. These are toxins that affect our immune system. Now this, this rundown of all these different toxin categories, uh, you might try to, try to uh, know, th- know these uh, categories and commit these to, memories, to memory when you get ready to take those certification exams. Because it wouldn't surprise me if there was a question that used some of this terminology. And may just come right out and ask you specifically about a nephrotoxin. What is a nephrotoxin? What, what, uh, what system is affected or what organs are affected by a nephrotoxin? We can also, when we're thinking about toxin categories and classifications, uh, talk about a teratogen. A teratogen is a poison that can result in abnormal development of a fetus. That's what we have here illustrated in this picture. Abnormal development of, it looks like a Holstein calf. Uh, A carcinogen is a poison, a toxin that has, that indicates that it causes cancer. Um, but one thing that just as a sidebar, and check me on this, do your own research, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, but when I was, you know, years ago when I was first starting to study this and uh, did a unit on carcinogens, and one of the things I ran into in my research is that, yeah, there are chemicals out there that, that are cancer causing, that are carcinogenic, but most cancer in humans related to smoking or diet, what we eat or what we inhale in terms of smoking, tobacco smoke primarily. So there are carcinogens in the workplace that can cause cancer, but what may be more harmful for our employees is what they eat when they get home, what they have in their lunchbox, and what they do at the breaks if they're a smoker. And that, you know, thinking about the health side of safety, uh, and the development of a wellness program in a company, that might be something for companies to consider as well. Many companies have smoking cessation programs. Many companies have um, uh, programs to help their employees eat better, to eat a healthier diet. So it's not just the chemicals in the workplace that we think of as being all nasty and bad. It may be the food and some of our, some of our other habits that can result not just in cancer, but maybe some other health problems as well. Uh, A mutagen, this is a toxin that causes genetic changes, changes in our DNA. It changes, it mutates our genes. Uh, Ames testing is a test that is used, and I mention this because this sometimes comes up on the CSP exam also, AIMS testing is a testing procedure to identify uh, mutagenic characteristics of different substances. But I want to go back to to, to teratogen just to illustrate this a little bit. We may not watch the whole video. Uh, Some of you may be familiar with thalidomide and the, 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 the thalidomide problem in the early 60s. If not, let's take a quick look at this video. This is a classic example of a chemical that resulted in widespread birth defects around the the world. Uh, The drug was developed in Germany. And I say drug, this was a medication. This was a medication that was developed and it was prescribed by doctors. Um, 
it was found out later after several years of this drug being in existence that it was a teratogen that it caused birth defects but let me shut up and let me show you a brief uh, excerpt from this video cooking is my life at hsn.com discover all of chef wolfgang's online cooking demos Afternoon. I have several announcements. Every doctor, every hospital, every nurse have been notified. Every woman in this country must be aware that it's most important that they check their medicine cabinet and that they do not take this drug. In the early 1960s, no drug struck more fear into the hearts of pregnant women. One of the most horrifying episodes in medical history. Than thalidomide. It changed our relationship with the drugs we use. One reason U.S. drug laws are so strict, thalidomide. And became an example of what many saw as corporate greed at its worst. British thalidomide children so far have not received any compensation from the rich company that made the drug which crippled them so brutally. But this dark chapter is only part of thalidomide's enigmatic story, one that continues to reverberate today. I had used up every other alternative when I took thalidomide. In 1960, a new wonder drug was slated to arrive on American shores, a sedative that was said to also treat a range of other ills. A hypnotic, as the doctors call it, that was the answer to a prayer. Its generic name was thalidomide. The hallmark defining quality of thalidomide was its safety. So safe that in Germany there was no prescription needed. The German company that developed thalidomide, Chemie Grunenthal, claimed that even pregnant women could take it. The drug company had handed out samples of this drug all over the place, starting with employees of its own company. On Christmas Day in 1956, a baby girl was born in Germany without ears. And she was the daughter of an employee of the drug company Grunenthal. No immediate connection was made to thalidomide, which soon sold nearly as well as aspirin in some European countries. We received it in quantities, like a thousand pills. There was tremendous pressure all over the world to get this wonderful new drug on the market. They had two million tablets ready to go the moment the FDA approved the drug, which was almost a foregone conclusion until one doctor came along and began working at the FDA. It just so happened that my first application was for the drug thalidomide. I got this because I was new and they thought I should have an easy one to start on. But Dr. Kelsey was uneasy with what she saw as the lack of rigorous scientific studies and the slipshod presentation of safety data provided by Grunenthal and William S. Merrill the U.S. distributor of the drug. The best thing that could be said about thalidomide at the time was simply that you could not kill a rat no matter how much thalidomide the rat ate. With thalidomide being prescribed for morning sickness in other countries, Kelsey became particularly concerned with what effect it might have on a developing fetus. In June of 1961, an article appeared promoting its safety during late pregnancy. It was allegedly written by a Dr. Ray Nolson, but in fact, the article was written by the medical director of the drug company. About six months later, long ignored evidence became public in Germany, linking thalidomide to a rash of birth defects. Although hundreds of thousands of pre-market samples had been provided to American doctors, Dr. Kelsey's stubborn delay of the drug's approval for more than a year had prevented a similar scale of tragedy from unfolding in the United States. Dr. Kelsey was absolutely a unique hero. If anybody would like to watch the rest of that video, uh, it's available. I just wanted to, to share it with you to give you a little bit of a history lesson if you're not familiar with thalidomide already, and also to, to uh, give you a, an example of a teratogen. Uh, again, it, not in the workplace, uh, but there are 
chemical substances in the workplace that can have that effect, that can uh, affect a developing fetus. The information about whether it's a teratogen, carcinogen, mutagen is available in a lot of different sources of information. Um, if you're th talking about carcinic, carcinogenic substances specifically, here's a CDC list of carcinogenic substances. And it's alphabetized, and as you see, there's quite a list. But that's just one example of sources of information. When we look at the uh, toxic substance portal, also from the CDC, um, uh, we'll see the, the vast amount of information that's available for different substances, including information about whether it affects a developing fetus, whether it can cause mutations at the gene level, a mutagen, or, and also whether it's a carcinogen. One particular class of uh, toxins that we need to talk about would be asphyxiants. Uh, asphyxiants are substances that disrupt our respiratory system functioning. Uh, we, and when our respiratory system, system functioning is disrupted, we're not able to get the oxygen we need to our, our body's tissues. The oxygen supply to our body's tissues is disrupted. Now there are two types of asphyxiants. There's the simple asphyxiant. It causes oxygen to be displaced from the environment. And there's when oxygen is displaced from the environment, there's no oxygen available to occupants of the space. An example of that would be carbon dioxide. If carbon dioxide is released into a space, it can displace the oxygen in that area. And when that oxygen in the area is displaced, then any occupants will, will not have the oxygen they need. The other type of, of asphyxiant is the chemical asphyxiant. The chemical asphyxiant results in a chemical reaction in the body that interferes with the body's ability to process to use oxygen. Uh, carbon monoxide is, I would say, the most common, the most dangerous chemical asphyxiant. Uh, carbon monoxide affects the red blood cells in uh, our body and it, it prevents our red blood cells from carrying oxygen to the tissues that need that oxygen. Uh, to be more specific, uh, it, it forms carboxyhemoglobin. The carboxyhemoglobin attaches to the red blood cells. When there's carboxyhemoglobin attached to those red blood cells, then there's no room for oxygen to attach and be carried. But we'll talk more about this when we talk about the respiratory system and respiratory system diseases. Another issue to think about uh, when we talk about industrial toxicology is acute versus chronic toxicity. When we talk about acute toxicity, we're talking about uh, an immediate effect upon exposure. Uh, the worker is exposed to H2S in the workplace and there's a me an immediate effect. There's immediate uh, symptoms that occur. Again, H2S is a good example. There are other examples as well. A chronic toxicity or the chronic effect, this is when symptoms develop over time with repeated or continual exposure to a toxin. You have chronic exposure to the same toxic substance or the same harmful substance over time. And with, chronic, with this chronic toxicity effect, it could be 10, 12, 15 years before the, the affected worker shows any symptoms. Uh, lead is an example of chronic toxicity or a substance that tends to, to build up within a person's body over time and it could be years before the effects are experienced, before any symptoms show up. Uh, 
Another example of, of a chronic effect would be silica exposure. Uh, for the most part, silica doesn't affect the worker with one exposure. It can if there is an extreme, extremely high exposure level to uh, respirable silica, that can have an immediate effect. But generally, silica affects the workers over an extended period of exposure, again, seven, 10, 15 years. And we'll talk more about silica and lead and H2S when we get to our respiratory system unit. Another thing to consider, um, and this kind of goes along with acute or and, and or chronic toxicity, is system selectivity. Uh, some organ systems are affected by some toxins, but not others. Toxicity research attempts to identify organ systems most susceptible to harmful effects. You know, going back to when we talked about nephrotoxins and hematoxins and uh, neurotoxins. Well, that's the result of research identifying which organ system is affected by different toxins. Some toxins have been identified as nephrotoxins. They affect the kidneys, the renal systems. Some have been identified as hepatoxins. They, they select and have the greatest impact on, on the liver. Some are neurotoxins affecting the central nervous system. But again, it's not everything's equal when it comes to toxins. The toxins, you may be able, you may be able to pour a, a toxin in a liquid form on your skin and not have any ill effects. It may not affect your skin at all. But when it gets into your bloodstream, when it absorbs through the skin, gets into your bloodstream, it can then, then affect other organ systems. Which gets us to this point, system toxicity or systemic toxicity. The chemical enters the bloodstream through skin absorption, uh, through the lungs, more specifically the blood air barrier in the alveoli, could be through the digestive system. There are several ways that substances can enter uh, our bloodstream in skin absorption, through that blood air barrier in the lungs and through our digestive system, the lining of the small intestine. Once it's in the bloodstream, then it's free to wreak havoc in a lot of different organ systems. This is where the greatest harm can occur. When, when substances get into our bloodstream and then can affect a variety of organ systems. It, and many substances can affect not just the, the nervous system, or, the, or the, the renal system. It can affect the nervous system, the renal system, uh, our other systems of the body as well. Another concept um, to be aware of is local or localized toxicity. This is where the toxin affects uh, the area with which it comes into contact with but does not enter the bloodstream and spread its effect to other organ systems. And related to everything we've talked about here, but really kind of the flip side of systemic toxicity is local toxicity. It affects your skin or it's ingested and it affects the lungs or ingested and it affects the digestive system, but it doesn't get into the bloodstream. It's inhaled, it may affect the lungs, but it doesn't get into the bloodstream. An example of, of a substance having localized toxicity or a localized effect, again, would be silica. Silica doesn't get into the bloodstream and cause harm that way. Silica does physical damage to the lung structure. In fact, silica, if you look on a bottle of vitamins, and I don't have a bottle right here, I would, I would hold it up for you. But if you look on a bottle of vitamins, there might actually be, uh, uh, as far as in the contents, uh, as a reference to silica. There's not, the FDA hasn't specified how much we need in our diet, but silica is considered a substance that we need in our diet to some degree. If we ingest a small amount of silica, it's, it's not going to have any harm on us. 
uh, harm for us, but it's when we breathe the microscopic respirable silica into our lungs, that's when it, it does its damage. And I know I'm talking a lot about silica. That has been big news in, in uh, uh, industrial safety and industrial hygiene and industrial toxicology, especially since 2017 when the new silica standard went into effect for the construction industry. But really, the, 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 the discussion of silica goes back to the Hawks Nest Tunnel incident. Uh, many, many years ago. And we'll talk more about Hawk's Nest when we get to respir uh, the respiratory system. That's when a lot of workers died over a very short period of time from silica exposure when they were working on the, the Hawk's Nest Tunnel project. Another concept related to industrial toxicology that we need to be familiar with, uh, sensitization. Uh, sensitization occurs when a worker or a person is exposed to a substance and at first they, they don't have any uh, response to it. it doesn't have any effect to them but the more they're exposed to that substance they become sensitized to that substance and they become susceptible to the toxins in that substance and as it says here exposure to a toxin Exposure to a toxin over time results in the worker being susceptible to harmful effects, to developing symptoms from that exposure. Again, no effect at first exposure. Re repeated exposure sensitizes the system. Once sensitized, the system will be adversely affected. There are several examples of substances that humans can become sensitive to with repeated exposure. One of those substances, uh, uh, poison ivy, the chemicals in poison ivy that causes the, the painful, uncomfortable rash. And it can be more serious as well. If, if there's burning poison ivy and the smoke is inhaled, it can affect the respiratory system. Uh, there, poison ivy can be bad stuff. It can even result in hospitalization and in very extreme cases where it's maybe the smoke is inhaled it could be fatal but this is a this the chemicals in poison ivy is one of those chemicals that maybe upon first exposure a person is not sensitive to but with repeated exposure they develop a sensitivity uh, to those chemicals in poison ivy uh, another example and i've got a point here or actually i have a text box here for this particular example uh, let's say we have a worker uh, that has skin exposure to microscopic chromium particles on a regular basis. At first, there is no allergic or irritant response. But after several years, they start to have a rash resulting from the chromium exposure. The worker has become sensitized. And this is something that can happen, happen with these microscopic chromium particles. Um, and I think th there are other examples uh, as well of this sensitization process. And again, I'm no doctor and I don't want to pretend to be a doctor and know more than I, I know. But uh, one thing that we notice or that I've noticed, there are people who did not have any allergies when they were younger, but they develop allergies later in life. In their 30s and 40s, they start developing uh uh, allergies to mold or pollen or uh, you know those springtime allergens that cause a lot of people a lot of pain and suffering uh, when they're young or when they were young they didn't have those allergens but as they got older they developed these allergies is that a sensitization process I would argue that it probably is sensitization that's going on but on the flip side of sensitization and jumping off from that developing allergies as we get older we can also talk about just the opposite, a desensitization. People may outgrow their allergies or may develop a tolerance for different substances. Maybe when you were young, you were allergic to, to uh, uh, the chemicals in poison ivy that causes the rash. But as you, as you aged, uh, 
um, your body developed a tolerance to those chemicals. Your body adapted to those chemicals. And if you think about it, again, no doctor, and I don't want to pretend to be a doctor. That's one of the things safety people have to be careful about. We, we, we know a little bit, just enough to be dangerous, but we have to realize our limitations. But, but think about uh, allergy treatments and allergy clinics. A allergy sufferer who goes to an allergy clinic, how is that treated? It's treated with a series of allergy shots. Once they do the, the patch tests or the different other forms of tests to determine what the patient is allergic to, then they put together a, a uh, series of shots that will help the patient develop a tolerance to these allergens. And the, the substance in the shots that they're taking is very small uh, exposures to the stuff that they're sensitive to. They're, they're given very small dosages of the stuff they're allergic to, the substances they're allergic to, and over time, with repeated allergy shots, repeated exposures, they become desensitized to uh, whatever it was they were sensitive to, whatever it was they were allergic to. Again, I just find this interesting, how, we, how our body can adapt, how we can develop a sensitivity, uh, an allergy, if you will, to different substances, but we can also develop a tolerance to different substances. The body, and you'll hear me say this multiple times throughout the class, uh, you know, our bodies are amazing. It is just, my goodness, the, you know, it, it's just amazing. It's mind-boggling to me how... Uh, how miraculously our body functions. And this is just one example of that. Um, let's see, we're going on, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and take a break here. Go ahead and stop here, and then we'll come back with a short part two of this lecture. Uh, so see you in part two of this lecture.